This video is the first of two videos that discuss the concept of chemical bonding. Here we will focus primarily on ionic bonds, where in the second video we'll focus primarily on covalent bonds. So let's begin with a quick overview of the video. Uh, first we'll talk about why chemical bonds form, and this will be a topic that's true for both ionic and covalent. We'll then dive right into the concept of ionic bonding. We'll start with a discussion on what an ionic bond really is, a definition, uh, and then we'll start discussing the forces that pull on electrons during ionic bonds that causes them to be different from covalent bonds. We'll then talk about the methodology for determining the formulas for ionic compounds. It has a lot to do with the charges created in ionic bonding. And then last but not least, we'll wrap up with a discussion of the crystal lattice structure. It's a way that ionic bonds work together to create larger scale compounds. That crystal lattice structure then leads into the idea that these compounds themselves have a set of properties that go along with them. Uh, and those properties are tied very closely to the lattice structure itself, as well as to the forces acting inside ionic compounds. Over to the right, you'll see a couple pictures. Uh, these pictures are actually naturally occurring crystals of substances, uh, and they result in the fact that the lattices, the arrangement of atoms, which has very regular patterns to it, creates very regular patterns in the crystals themselves. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end of the video, uh, but I always think it's fascinating to see uh, nature naturally generating structures or objects that have things that we would normally consider regular geometric shapes. So let's start with a discussion as to why chemical bonds form themselves. Uh, the key behind chemical bonding has to do with something we introduced in the previous chapter known as the octet rule. And the octet rule basically tells us that the most stable configurations of electrons are the ones with completely filled or one half filled orbitals. Uh, and as a result, atoms will naturally want to gain, lose, or share electrons in order to get these configurations. Gaining or losing is when we get ionic bonding forming, and sharing is when we get covalent bonding forming. Uh, but notice both bondings have the same goal in mind, it's to get those more stable configurations. Therefore, we can say that the driving force behind most chemical reactions is getting a more stable of configuration, more stable electron configuration for all the atoms in the compound itself. The difference then is the types of atoms involved in this process. Different atoms will use different bond types and reactions to achieve ultimately the same goal. And that type of bond is based on the properties of the atoms themselves. And the property that we're primarily interested in here that determines this is going to be electronegativity. We'll talk about a lot about electronegativity in this video, and we'll talk about it in the covalent video as well. But it's really the deciding force between whether you get an ionic bond or a covalent bond. Now that we've established why bonding itself happens, let's dive right into the specifics of this video, ionic bonding. In ionic bonds, uh, bonds form when there is an exchange of electrons, and that exchange is going to be characterized by a gain and a loss. This exchange results in the creation of what are known as ions, and ions, if we have to put a definition to it, are basically atoms with a charge. And that charge, in this case, for calcium, is going to be positive 2. If atoms are exchanging electrons, again, exchange infers a gain or a loss, uh, the atoms that lose their electrons are going to adopt a positive charge. If you recall, uh, an electron itself has a negative charge, therefore losing them leaves you with a net positive. We refer to these types of ions as cations. Likewise, other atoms are going to be gaining those electrons, and they are going to adopt a negative charge by gaining extra negatively charged electrons, and we refer to these guys as anions. Just a little terminology and a little basic definition of what an ion actually is. Continuing our discussion on ionic bonding, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the video, electronegativity is one of the things that determines whether this will happen or not. Uh, and electronegativity is the factor that will determine whether the atom is the type of atom that gains electrons and gets a negative charge or loses electrons and gets a positive charge. So if you recall, we defined electronegativity last chapter. It's the attractive force that an atom exerts on a bonding pair of electrons. If atoms have a very high electronegativity, that means they have a very strong pull. This means they are more likely to get electrons and as a result form an anion or something with a negative charge. 
Atoms with low electronegativities have a much weaker pull and as a result are more likely to lose their electrons and gain a positive charge. We can see the same exact concept in the form of diagrams. If you recall, electronegativity is very closely tied to uh, atomic radius. If we think of these two atoms, the small atom is going to have a strong electronegativity because its nucleus is very close to a bonding pair of electrons here in the middle, whereas the larger atom is going to have a very weak electronegativity. The end result is that when these two atoms are pulling on this electron, this atom over here is going to be able to pull with a very strong force, whereas this atom over here is only going to be able to pull with a relatively weak force. The end result is that this electron here gets taken by the atom on this side, so the electron solely orbits this. This atom adopts a negative charge. The lost electron from this atom means it adopts a positive charge, and now we've created an ionic bond. Looking at another pair of atoms here, these atoms have similar sizes and as a result will also likely have a similar values for electronegativity. When these two atoms pull on that shared pair of electrons, they're both going to pull with approximately the same force. And as a result, neither atom is going to be strong enough to pull the electron away from the other, and the end result is not going to be an ionic bond at all, but instead it's going to be a covalent bond, and we'll end up sharing the pairs of electrons between the two of them as opposed to one atom taking the other. So as we said before, electronegativity is really the key factor that determines what type of charges atoms actually adopt when they are an ionic bond, but it also determines whether or not an ionic bond will even be able to form based on how different the electronegativities are. Since we've established electronegativity as such a key factor here, it's very important to, memor or to remember that last chapter we identified patterns in electronegativity. Ionic bonding is dependent on having very big differences in electronegativity. Uh, and we recall that our highest electronegativity atoms are here on the top right, and our lowest electronegativity atoms are here on the bottom left. The bigger the difference, the more likely you are to get an ionic bond. We can use our trends from last chapter as a tool to predict those differences, but in actuality we don't usually need to go quite that far. We can simplify this discussion by simply saying this. Metals, which are the elements on the left side of the periodic table, separated by this line right here, tend to have very low electronegativities, whereas nonmetals on this side of the periodic table tend to have very high electronegativities. The end result we can say here is that ionic bonds are going to form between metals and nonmetals. So when a metal bonds to a nonmetal, that will create the significant difference in electronegativity that we're looking for. It'll allow the atom with the bigger electronegativity, the nonmetal, to take the electron and will create an ionic bond. So now that we've established what an ionic bond actually is, let's start talking about how we determine the formula of ionic compounds. Uh, the first thing we'll say here is that atoms in ionic bonds are held together by electromagnetic attractions. And that is occur between the oppositely charged particles. If you remember how magnets work, the north end of a magnet is always going to be attracted to the south end of a separate magnet. It has to be those oppositely charged poles that cause them to attract together. Same thing is true with ionic compounds. When they combine, they always have to combine in such a way that the net charge has to add up to zero. So all the positive charges that are attracted to all the negative charges have to ultimately cancel each other out. Looking at an example, uh, we can form an ionic compound by the combination of the element or the ion calcium with the ion chlorine. Calcium has a positive two charge, chlorine has a negative one charge. When they combine together, we're going to need two of the chlorines to cancel out the positive two charge. Again, the calcium was positive two. Each individual chlorine had a charge of negative one. When we combine all that up together, the net charge of the entire compound adds up to zero. So these subscripts here in an ionic compound are determined by getting the charges of the two separate ions to add to zero. We'll get a lot more practice with this when we start talking about nomenclature in the next sections. Right now we're just trying to establish the idea that the net charge on an ionic compound has to add up to zero.
Now that we brought it up, uh, calcium chloride is a substance you've probably seen before. Um, like many ionic compounds, it's a white crystalline solid creating a powder such as this. Uh, and it's very commonly used in uh, driveway applications when it snows in the winter. Uh, calcium chloride is one of the chemicals you can spread on your driveway or walkways to help the snow melt a little bit faster uh, and clear those driveways out. So as we get closer to the end of our discussion today, uh, we're going to talk about the structure that uh, ionic bonds tend to form, and it's very different than the structure we see from covalent bonding. Uh, as you recall, ionic bonds are held together by the opposite charges, similar to the poles of a magnet. In covalent bonding, atoms are linked together to one other specific atom. So you've got one hydrogen connected specifically to one carbon atom, and that's what makes it a covalent bond. In ionic bonding, the electromagnetic attraction is non-discriminatory. It's just being attracted to all other ions of the opposite charge. So any, any positively charged ion is going to be attracted to any negatively charged. There's no exclusivity like there is in a covalent bond. What this results in is a network of linked atoms held together by alternating charge as opposed to just one atom being linked. You can imagine there being a positively charged ion here, that's attracted to a negatively charged ion, which is then attracted to another positively charged and another negatively charged, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's not just one molecule at a time. The end result of all this linking is that we create compounds that are very, very strong. And we'll see that when we talk about the properties at the end of the video. This structure has a name to it. It's known as a crystal lattice. And what the crystal lattice is, is a regular 3D geometric arrangement of ions that are held together by the positive and negative charge attraction found in the ionic compounds or bonds themselves. So this little line we created here of alternating positive and negative charge is going to grow into something significantly larger when we start talking about it in three dimensions. Before we actually take a look at the pictures then, the last thing we can bring up is the fact that there are different ways that these atoms can arrange themselves in 3D. And those different or three-dimensional arrangements lead to different crystal shapes. Uh, you might have seen in movies how certain crystals grow uh, in particular shapes or different ways. Those shapes correspond to these different arrangements of atoms. So here's a first example of what a crystal lattice would look like in three dimensions. Uh, this is a crystal lattice that's often used to describe the compound sodium chloride, one of the most common uh, ionic compounds out there. Uh, these small little spheres in here would be our sodium atoms. The large green spheres in here would be our chlorine atoms. And we again see that there's this alternating pattern of positive and negative charge happening basically in all three coordinate directions. What you can see from this shape is that it creates this cube-like structure, and when we look at the actual crystals of naturally growing salt, we see the exact same thing. Notice the crystal at the macro scale, the scale we see, has a comparable shape to the crystal that grows at the nanoscopic scale, at the atomic level. And that's because, again, you can imagine this crystal growing larger and larger and larger as a single unity. It would adopt that same three-dimensional shape no matter how large it actually gets. When we start looking at more atoms, we feel like there's, we see that there are more possible ways for these crystals to form. Now, you're never responsible for knowing any of these shapes, but I do want you to be aware of the fact that there's a lot of shapes out there. Uh, we're looking right now at what we call um, simple cubic, what's going up here, but a lot of these other structures are, exist as well. As a result, we see crystals that grow in lots of crazy and wacky shapes. Uh, this over here, for example, is a sample of the element bismuth. While not technically an ionic compound, it still grows in a crystal-like pattern. Uh, in this scenario, bismuth identifies or connects to this rhombic pattern over here. And these rhombuses are what create these uh, angles that we see as these crystals grow, as well as some of the right angles here. Now, obviously, the complexity of how this crystal grew has a lot more going on to it, but the basic shape still comes back uh, to the rhombus that we show here. So in short, the way your atoms arrange themselves in a crystal lattice is going to determine how they eventually shape themselves as a crystal as a, in a larger scale. So all of this interlocking, again, translates into the properties that ionic compounds have. We talked about them as being very strong, uh, and we see that in the form of having very high melting points. It's very hard to get those lattices to break down and turn these substances into liquid. We're talking thousands of degrees, typically, to melt these objects. They're very brittle. They're held together so well that they're none likely to flex, and as a result, when you try to cause them to flex, they tend to break instead. 
Uh, these ionic compounds are very good at conducting electricity, especially when dissolved in solutions or when molten after they've been liquefied. And typically, they're very soluble in water. And we'll talk more about the conductivity and solubility later on uh, when we're discussing the ideas of solubility. There's forces at play that explain to us why ionic compounds are particularly good at doing this. Because they're held together so well, uh, they don't give off a lot of gases, which generally makes these compounds inflammable. And last but not least, ionic compounds collectively are referred to as salts. Uh, we typically reserve the word salt for table salt, the salt that we're familiar with, but generally speaking, the word salt is for any ionic compound. Looking at a couple examples that fit these patterns very, very well, uh, we do have table salt there on the top lot, on the top uh, left there, and calcium chloride on the bottom left, the chemicals we've already talked about in this video. Both of them fit all of these characteristics as having very high melting points, being brittle, both conduct electricity very well, both are very soluble in water, and neither of them are flammable. As we'll see with both this video and the covalent video, there are compounds that don't necessarily fit the mold quite as well. On the picture on the right here, we have the substance marble. Uh, marble definitely has a high boiling point. Marble is definitely very brittle, but marble generally does not dissolve very well in water, otherwise our countertops wouldn't work very well. And generally speaking, when it does, it doesn't conduct electricity very well either. So these general properties that we come up with like ionic compounds, while reasonable, aren't necessarily always 100%. And you'll, again, you'll see the same thing with covalent. Last thing we can bring up then is an application of these particular substances. Uh, what you're seeing there in that scarier looking picture at the bottom corner, uh, ionic compounds are used in lethal injections when uh, states decide to execute prisoners who have committed uh, particularly heinous crimes. Uh, the chemical in question used for those ex executions is a very simple and very commonly available ionic compound, potassium chloride. Uh, potassium chloride is a muscle relaxant. The potassium plus one ion K with the charge of plus one is actually a common ion and it's part of your natural diet. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of potassium. Bananas, for example, are a great source of that. Uh, in the lethal injection, the thing that makes the potassium chloride so dangerous is that the potassium chloride is injected directly into the bloodstream uh, and it's injected in very, very large quantities. Uh, as I said, it's a muscle relaxant. Uh, if you're exposed to too much of it when directly injected, uh, it will relax your muscles to the point where they stop working, including, for example, your heart and your lungs, which is what eventually causes the patients to die. Um, so again, a, a little bit darker, but definitely a, a very notable and very uh, relevant uh, application of these particular stuff. So let's wrap things up then. At this point in time, you should be able to do a couple things. Uh, you should be able to explain to me why bonds form in the first place. And that again, that explanation is going to be consistent for both ionic and covalent. Uh, you should be able to describe ionic bonding itself, uh, how the atoms are actually attached together by their positive and negative charges and the role that electronegativity plays in that. You should be able to write the formulas of ionic compounds based on their charges. You should be able to briefly describe the concept of lattice structure, although I don't expect you to do a ton with that. And last but not not least, you should be able to recognize the properties that an ionic compound has. Uh, we'll talk about the properties that go along with covalent, and ultimately that'll lead into a lab activity uh, that we're going to be doing a little later on in the process. Last but not least, the picture to the right there is just a comparison between the two, and we'll see this picture again with our covalent bonding video. Uh, and ionic bonding, it's all about the exchange of electrons creating a negative and positively charged ion. Covalent bonding is all about the sharing of electrons, um, but again, the goal is always the same. It's about getting to better configurations for both individual atoms.